through music, through, uh, through the passage that's been, been selected, Lord. I pray you would have the freedom to speak to our minds and our hearts today. And just thank you for loving us and giving us Jesus. And this time of community together, you're awesome. And uh, just again, thank you for your love for us. And pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Missy O'Day. Am I, uh, did I clip it on right? Am I good? I'm turned on? Perfect. Thank you. Hey, it's really great to be with you guys. I'm honored to step in for uh, your pastor and to be able to be with you this morning. And also, I, I, think, I don't think I've ever been able to say that I've preached in a coffee shop before, which is really cool, right? I love this. Yeah, I mean, you know, so a lot of churches, kind of the trendy thing is to have a coffee shop, sort of the trendy thing to do that gets used for a few minutes before and after services, but like, who gets to preach in a coffee shop? So this is fantastic, and I really love what your community is about. I love the way that you guys are focused in on loving and serving the people outside of your walls. I mean, I could go down the list of the things that I respect and love about this church, this community, uh, the vision that Scott and Lori had with your leaders to begin a church like this, which is way out of the box of what most people aim for or think you know, American churches need to look like. And so I love, love, love what you guys are all about here. And um, uh, if, if I end up planting a church in the future, which is a, a possibility that we're thinking and praying about, um, a lot of how and what we do, fancy, it's got the turn the knob, there it is. A lot of uh, is stuff that I've been learning from and watching you guys do. Uh, and I probably could go off on on the current state of Western church, but I won't. Um, so again, I just, I love, love what you guys are doing. So thanks for, for being here, and um, I am going to start here, Luke chapter 15. I'm not even, I don't remember what version I copied this from, so this may or may not match your version. Luckily, it's on the screen. I'm going to read this passage from Luke 15 out loud, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at this. Verse number one, now the tax collectors and Sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Next slide. I tell you, Jesus says, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. And this is where I'll stop. Uh, but Jesus goes on and tells the story that most of us have heard called the prodigal son. Many, many of us have heard the story, the prodigal son. That's a story that I love to tell. Uh, it's a little longer story than these first couple ones. But basically, uh, a son decides that he wants his freedom, and he asks his father, give me my inheritance now. Uh, and he goes off, and he blows the whole thing and finds himself living in poverty and he's taking care of pigs to survive and then he comes to his senses decides he's going to repent that he's going to go back home and hopes that maybe his father will let him live in the house and what he finds is this father who's waiting for him open arms embraces him blows his mind the love of the father that's the third story that we're not going into um and that's the story i love to tell it's actually my favorite sermon to tell and, and a couple of my friends that have come uh, probably have heard me tell that story you know, a bunch of times, right, Stephanie? Ben? Yeah, okay. Um, but, but that story, oftentimes we get to that story, and we skip over these first two stories, because we're kind of going after the, the preachers. We like to go after the home run hitter, the prodigal son. And again, I love that story, uh, because it's the story of a wayward son, of a loving father, a waiting father, 
But according to Jesus in these stories here, God is not just a waiting father. He's, he's also like a, a desperate mother who, having lost a coin, lights a lamp, sweeps the house, searches carefully until she finds it. But it's not coins that God cares about. God cares about people. A uh, God who moves heaven and earth to find people. And when he does, he rejoices. And he rejoices like a shepherd, because God is also like a shepherd who had a sheep that wandered off, and when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, carries it all the way home. These three little stories in Luke 15, three parables that some of us are probably a little bit familiar with, and they describe who God is and what he's like. And I just remember growing up, and, and when my son Noah was growing up, these, these even sound a little bit like cute bedtime stories, right? A little bit. But, um, but there's more going on here than these parables than simply that. There's more going on, the more than the nice little lamb or a coin that gets lost or a kid that was rebellious, because behind the scenes of these parables, in the life of Jesus, while he's telling these stories 2,000 plus years ago, in that context, there's a storm that's brewing. There's a storm that's brewing, tensions in his situation, the people around him were rising, and suspicions were growing about this Jesus guy. And instead of Jesus playing nice to pacify his critics, <laughs> Jesus responds by telling these three stories. And what he does, interestingly, he tells these stories in front of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he tells them in front of the sinners, quote-unquote, the sinners, and he does it at the same time, which kind of, as you might imagine, made things even more tense. Like, these aren't sweet little bedtime stories about kids that, you know, or a coin that got lost or a sheep that wandered away. No, no more is going on than that kind of a story. Uh, look back at verse 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. See, if we read through the Gospels even up to this point already, Jesus had this track record uh, of hanging out with people that the religious crowd is unhappy with. Earlier in the book of Luke, we hear them complain, Jesus doesn't just preach at the sinners. The real problem is that Jesus accepts these people, these sinners. He actually eats with them, which in that culture, back in that day, that means you treated somebody as your equal. In that culture, back in that day, you didn't extend what they would call a table fellowship to someone unless you accepted them as your friends. And apparently... He does this before they get their act cleaned up. And apparently that was also then a really big problem for the, for the religious elite. And it irritated them that Jesus acted that way. In fact, this word murmur, uh, muttering, um, is also interpreted in other versions as murmuring. And it's a word that only gets used twice in the New Testament. Here's a little like Greek geekiness here, sorry. Uh, and the word muttering, we can back up to it again. Um, that it says muttering, that word only gets used twice, and it talks about kind of this undercurrent of swirling and complaining that doesn't have the courage to actually come and directly talk to somebody. They're just, they're just complaining, and, and it's doing it in a way that the word says incites rioting. So like it wasn't just a little bit of grumbling. It was a big deal. They were really complaining, these religious folks, and their complaint was, listen, if Jesus is really the son of God, like he's claiming. If he was really the son of God, he would know the kind of people that, that are gathering around him, and he wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. And not only is he touching them, he's welcoming them. He's eating with them. See, basically, Jesus here is building a community. Uh, he's building a faith-based community where those who had been on the outside were now being invited to the inside. And it was making the religious leaders furious. I mean, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they had expended a lot of energy uh, on their rules in order to help people see who's in, who's out. And if you are out because you're not following our rules, we have a wall that we've built up between us. And what they had done is build walls up between them and the very people to whom they were supposed to offer faith 
and hope. But Jesus comes, <laughs> and he just starts breaking these rules down, breaking these walls down, and that's the context. We have to have that in mind when we read these three stories. And when we remember and see that, it, it actually kind of gives these parables a little more of an edge, doesn't it? Because these aren't just little random feel-good lost and found stories about a cute little lamb or a coin that rolled away or a rebellious kid. These stories are an explanation from Jesus about why he does what he does. Because there's something more going on here. See, the Pharisees, the religious leaders that are upset with him, they didn't get it. But God is the kind of God who cares about lost sheep, lost coins, lost kids, which is precisely what Jesus is getting at. Now, I hadn't really seen it from this angle until my pastor, Dave Johnson, from my home church back in Minnesota, uh, he phrased it this way. Uh, but here's the question, Dave says. This is the question that Jesus is asking the religious elite through these stories. Jesus is saying, if God is the kind of God who cares about and relentlessly pursues lost sheep, lost coins, lost kids, then Pharisees, religious leaders, why don't you? Why don't you? I mean, Jesus grew, Jesus grew up in that culture. He was a rabbi, and so, so he even would understand why they're mad about what he does. He could even say, listen, I, I get it. I understand why you guys are mad, why you're angry, why you're grumbling, why you're confused. But honestly, I'm confused too. <laughs> I'm confused about why you don't receive sinners, as you call them. So Jesus starts out here by asking a question. Verse 4, suppose one of you has a uh, hundred sheep and loses one of them, does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And, and Jesus is saying, like, right, right? Who wouldn't do that? Wouldn't, wouldn't anybody do that, right, guys? Wouldn't, wouldn't you go? So on one level, he's kind of explaining himself to them, why he eats with sinners and tax collectors, because he's saying, guys, they're like lost sheep, and, and who wouldn't do that? Who wouldn't go after lost sheep? I mean, he's asking the question, who among you, he says, you know, what man among you wouldn't do such a thing? And I kind of wish, like, don't you wish that the, that the scribes and Pharisees would say, oh, pff, of course, Jesus, now that you explain it that way, yeah, now we understand, Jesus, why you do this thing that disgusts us, you know, eating with and befriending these people. Um, which would be nice if, if they responded that way, if they actually said that, but uh, that ain't happening. And so Jesus, um, this is one of the ways, I mean, your pastor Scott has a lot of ways that he's in, you know, similar to Jesus. This is one of them. Jesus is being sarcastic, you know, right? <laughs> this is a similarity that Pastor Scott has right there. Um, it's also a huge confrontation. See, in, in real life, shepherds back in Jesus' day, shepherds were despised. They were really looked down on. There's a guy named Ken Bailey. He's a scholar, a missionary to the Middle East. Uh, had lived over there for a long time. He writes great stuff about these parables and helps understand the context. And he points out that most people, if they even had sheep, because most people didn't have them, but if they had sheep, maybe they had three or four or five sheep. That was it. So a hundred sheep, like you'd be a rich person. And if you were rich, there's no possible way that you're going to bother looking for one sheep, Right? If you even cared about that one sheep, you'd hire a, a common person lower on the social strata to do the dirty work. You'd never see a dignified person wearing the royal robes like a scribe or a Pharisee. You wouldn't see them out traipsing through a pasture somewhere looking for one dumb, lost, lonely sheep. As if this one sheep, this one stupid sheep, you know, mattered to these people because it didn't matter. And even if I did want that sheep found, like, I'd send you. I ain't going, right? So when Jesus says, what man among you wouldn't go looking? The answer to his sarcastic question would have been, really? <laughs> like, the answer would have been, none of us, right? None of them would do it. And they knew it. They knew that. And they knew exactly what Jesus meant when he told this story of a cute little lamb it wasn't a bedtime story for them. 
and it ticked them off even more until you keep reading it. It's not very long before it ticked them off so badly, this and the other stuff that Jesus said and did, that they have him killed. Part of me is like, hey, 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 would somebody get Jesus a copy of that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? <laughs> yeah, he wasn't going to play nice. And then verse 5, he does find the sheep, and he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So there's rejoicing. Like he's saying, hey, there's rejoicing when he finds that sheep. And, and even though it's a lot of work, because you've got to carry that thing home, because sheep, when they lay down, they won't budge. You've got to carry them. And isn't that just like Jesus? Yeah, Jesus in this story is saying, I am not ashamed to do the work of a lowly shepherd. It is not beneath me to remove my royal robes and go stomping through the mud. And when he brings the sheep home, he calls his neighbors and, and, and tells them, hey, rejoice with me. Get happy. Get happy because I found my sheep that was lost. So what kind of God is God? Well, he's that kind of God. So yes, says Jesus, yes, I will do the dirty work, and no, I won't despise it, and yes, I'll receive sinners and befriend them and eat with them as well, and I know, <laughs> I know that it confuses and angers and bothers you, scribes and Pharisees and religious people, but I got to tell you, what confuses and bothers and angers me is that you don't, <laughs> you don't do that stuff. And Jesus says there is more joy over one sinner that repents, which is a word that simply means to turn around or to come back home. There's joy, more joy over that than 99 people who never need repentance, or I'd probably say <laughs> think that they don't at least. Right? Friends, hear me. I think that the reason people like this, these religious leaders, don't get grace is because they don't know they need it. They just don't know they need it. And sometimes, by the way, that's me. <laughs> I forget that I need it too. And then Jesus, without taking a breath, boom, right? He turns his attention to this story about the woman who had 10 coins. And everybody in that culture would have understood right away, most likely that's like her life saving. This is what she's going to live on for the rest of her lifetime. And, and she loses one of those 10 coins. So this coin gets lost and Jesus asks the same question, what woman wouldn't do this? Which, by the way, there's kind of an interesting little side note here. Jesus is playing a character in each of these stories, right? So he's the shepherd in the first story. In this story, he's... He's connecting with the imagery of a woman, which you talk about a radical viewpoint. <laughs> that would have been unheard of in that day. So just saying, we'll move back here to the text. Um, when this woman realizes one of her ten coins is missing, she's so frantic about it that Jesus says she lights her lamp in the middle of the day. She's using precious oil that costs money. She frantically sweeps her whole house and searches carefully until she finds that coin. Again, she uses the word joy twice to describe what she experiences and how she invites her neighbors to come over and celebrate with her, saying, hey, good news, good news, everybody. You can rejoice. Be happy with me, for I have found the coin. Again, when Jesus is telling this story, uh, he's being a little sarcastic again toward the religious dudes. He's like, well, you know, what woman among you is like, <laughs> right? He's... These men had no respect for women, zero. A and the scribes and Pharisees, they were so wealthy that a lost coin would not have mattered much to them. So this peasant woman's desperate search would have been no big deal. Like, they had more important things to worry about. So what kind of God is God? Turns out he's like a royal shepherd in the first story who took off his royal robes to go stomping through the mud after a stupid lamb that had lost its way. That work is not beneath him. And it turns out that he's like a crazy woman <laughs> who would move heaven and earth to find something or someone that most others would find little value in. And, and maybe Jesus would say, I imagine, and all of that, you guys, all of that is why I accept and befriend Sinners, and I eat with them too, treating them as equals. And so Jesus is saying to the religious people, 
I know the fact that I do this confuses and bothers and angers you scribes, you Pharisees, but I got to tell you, <laughs> what confuses and bothers is and angers me is that, that you guys don't, that you don't value lost people and lost sheep and rejoice when they are found. And I imagine him even saying, so listen, if that's you, then don't tell me that you know God. Because you look nothing like the heart of God. You still think this is a cute little bedtime story? (laughs) Yeah. A little side note here about lost sheep and lost coins. Because when sheep get lost, it's not because they're rebellious or angry. Like, meh, I hate you. So, (laughs) thank you. That was my sheep impersonation. Um, But yeah, no, sheep's not mad, right? They're not angry um the son by the way in the third story the the prodigal son the story we didn't really cover he's like that a little bit and interestingly the father in that story doesn't chase him right he lets him go he waits for him but in the beginning he just lets him go right but sheep right when sheep get lost they just wander (laughs) they get distracted right they pick up the scent of something that smells good and off they go and sounds sounds a little bit like um You and me, huh? (laughs) For me, anyways, it's usually not like, you know, I'm leaving home. I hate God. I'm out of here. No, no. No, I I love God, and I never mean to leave God, but, oh, look at that. That smells good. (laughs) And I get going in a different direction. Seriously, I mean, that's, that's how sheep get lost. That's how we get lost sometimes as well, and... You end up going the wrong direction, and you didn't even know you were going the wrong direction, but you're further and further from home, and you finally look up, and you look around and wonder, how did I ever get here? Like, this is not where I want to be. This is not how I want to live. And it occurs to me that um, maybe there's some of us in this room that that are lost that way, even right now, right here. And you look at your life, what's going on around you in your life, and you go, how did, I, how did I ever get here? And how will I ever get home? You know, every week there's some of us that show up at church, <laughs> um, and that's why we're here, hoping that even being here today will help you find your way. And so I just, for a second, want to say, if you identify with that lost sheep, um, I got good news for you. You're in the right place this morning. You're in the right place. You've come to the right place. That's the, the sheep, okay? But, but now think about the coin, right? Okay, the sheep got distracted, but the coin, think about it, literally, the coin has no choice at all. The coin is not responsible. It just got lost. It's not responsible that it lost. And I kind of sometimes wonder if that's true for some people as well. Um, but here's what happened to the coin. It just fell through the cracks. Just fell through the cracks. And if someone doesn't get sweeping... And if someone doesn't get looking, if someone doesn't start searching carefully, then this coin, these coins may never get found. Because unlike the sheep that can at least go, eh, you know, it's saying, hey, 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 here I am, help me. The coin can't make any sound at all. It just sits there. It never rejected God, like it doesn't even have a concept of God. And I look at this, idea of lost coins, the least of the least, the most lost of the lost, the forgotten people treated as disposable people who fall through the cracks. Right? In Jesus' day, they were the sick and the lame, the lepers, the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the people that were cast aside, you know, just get out of our way. But Jesus touched them, didn't he? Um, 30 seconds, one minute here. Turn to somebody next to you, around you, um, twos or threes. W- what does the least of the least look like today in our culture? Just take somebody close by, three for you, and, and just take, I'll give you one minute and then I'll come back and, and retrieve some answers. So just take a minute. What do the least of the least look like in our culture today? Just a short little phrase. Who? Who are they? So if you see somebody by themselves, feel free to pull them in.
That's a good way to let you know it's coming, right? I didn't have any theme music. That was my bad. All right, all right, all right. So um, somebody from a few different groups, you can give your quick answer or someone else's. What, what does it look like? Which survey? Yeah. Homeless people. Good. Yep. Smart table back here. Good looking, but not smart, they're saying. All right. Yep. Sex trafficking. Children. Children. Yep. Mm. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So wealthy people can look like they've got it all, <laughs> but it's a deceptive thing because they really have nothing, right? Yeah. Good. Neighbor. Our neighbor. Yeah. Excellent. Mentally ill. Absolutely. Really good. Refugees. Refugees. I could promise you. I knew that was my wife's answer. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people with disabilities and children. Okay. Oh, yeah, children with deformities or their scars. Yeah, yeah, true. Very good. Yeah, people avoid looking at them. Yep, yep, that's true. Anybody else who over here? Yeah. The addicted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else? We covered it pretty good. Anybody else? Different political views. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Nursing homes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Very true. You know, it's funny is I haven't been in a nursing home in forever, and we recently had one of Heidi's relatives pass. And you forget. I forget, right? It's so, if you don't have a family member, you just forget that there are so many people. It's, yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's great. Yeah. People that are sick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. People, we don't like hospitals. Pastors don't like hospitals. We don't like to pray for people and they don't get well because, uh oh, where's my faith at? Right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Anybody else? Take one more if we got one more. People that are in the gay, lesbian. Yep, 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 yep. So these are the least of the least, the forgotten, those in our culture who just get cast aside, right? They just get cast aside. Um, and like Heidi mentioned, like, so we, there's local and then there's global, right? There's refugees. You see pictures in the news of refugees. You see pictures of the famine in South Sudan. You've got little kid with flies crawling up their nose, the mom sitting the next to them, not knowing what to do. But these folks aren't mad at God. <laughs> they may not even have a real concept of God. A and when we stop with the heart of Jesus, which, by the way, if you belong to him, he's planted it in you. <laughs> Sometimes we bury it under all kinds of other stuff, but it's already in you. It's not about you trying harder to give a rip. It's in there. He'll call it forth. A and... Seeing that stuff here, there, right around us kind of wants you to, m <laughs> you kind of want to pick up a broom, right? <laughs> you just want to get a broom and start sweeping, right? So what kind of God is God? Jesus says here, he's like a crazy woman with the broom, touching the untouchable, sweeping the floor to look for lost, broken people. And I know I'm reading between the lines, but I think he's saying, to the religious folks, I know it bothers and angers you, scribes, Pharisees, religious folks, but I got to tell you what confuses and bothers and angers me is that you don't. There's a guy back in the 60s uh, named Clarence Jordan wrote uh, the Cotton Patch Gospels, pretty unconventional. Some of the theology is not necessarily what we would go, oh yeah, that's right on, uh, but very insightful, creative, worth considering Ideas And back then in the 60s, he actually preached in the South. It was a hostile environment, very legalistic Southern Baptist culture back then. And, and what he did is he described the kingdom of God, unlike most pe preachers were describing and preaching it at the time. And, and when it comes to this story, the lost uh, coin, the parable of the woman and the lost coin, he asked this. He said, what does she do? <laughs> well, she gets a broom, and she sweeps and sweeps, 
and sweeps. She lights a lamp and she sweeps until what? Until she wore the broom out? <laughs> no. Until the lamp went out? No. How long did she sweep? Until she found it. And how long was that? As long as necessary. <laughs> I read that. I just love that. I love that. I heard that. And everything in me just rises up and says, yes, yes, it's time to get a broom and to get to sweeping. And I actually preached a similar message to this when I was pastoring my last church. And, and I remembered, you know what? We got to remember, we're not sweeping the church. Now, listen, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys get this. <laughs> I love the local church. I've given my life to serving the local church. But if we are going to join Jesus in sweeping, we're going to have to do it out <laughs> there. And yes, I want him to show up and come here. That's fine. But here's the deal in our culture right now. You guys know this for the most part. The actual lost sheep and lost coins, they ain't coming in here. They'd be more likely to come here to your church than most. Um, but Jesus knew that the lost sheep and coins, they aren't coming in, right? So his call to us has always, always, always been to go out there. And so if Jesus showed up here today and, and told us, hey, hey, you guys, <laughs> come on, let's go. Let's come on, get out there with me and, and let's, let's, let's go sweeping. Join me in sweeping. Would we hear his call to us if he showed up and said that? Would we hear his call and what would we respond like? What would our reaction be? Would we rejoice? Maybe. Or would we grumble? Because either way, it kind of tells us where we are in the parable. Which is, I think, a decent question. So where are you in the parable? Because maybe some of us, maybe some of us here are, are, are lost sheep. We don't hate God, <laughs> but because you wandered away, maybe you're pretty sure God hates you or at least is very disappointed in you. And I'm here to tell you what Pastor Scott and the rest of your team here would tell you. Um, God doesn't hate you. <laughs> He's looking for you. Um, little advice, if, if that's you, if you resonate with that, then, then today, at the end of this message, um, or before you leave here, if that's you, if you identify with that lost sheep, that's where you're at right now, make a, make a little noise, you know? You don't have to go, ah, you know, but, <laughs> but just, just cry out to God, right? Cry out to God. Ask somebody here to pray with you. So maybe you identify with sheep or, or like do you identify with the Pharisee? Like is something in you going, oh man, yeah, I'm kind of grumbling, right? And I know that's not too likely. You actually kind of probably scare those kind of folks off, <laughs> which is a good thing. But, but I know that there's times in my life where I just get crabby and grumpy about stuff. Um, and so if you find yourself thinking about caring about the least and the lost or people that see things differently politically, then than you do, um, if you're kind of crabbing and grumbling about it, I just want to be kind and say, listen, if that's you, you don't have to be that way. Just come and join us. Like, come, come and pick up a broom, which is how some of you are responding, right? Some of you are going, I just want to pick up a broom. I want to start sweeping and finding. In fact, I want to spend the rest of my life figuring out where these lost coins are because if we don't go looking for them and find them, then they might not ever get found. And I think that that's why the local church is here, by the way. It's not to have a great coffee shop in your lobby. It's not to have a great concert with a smoke machine and light show and trying to get tons of people to come it's not about marketing and growing bigger crowds the reason the local church exists is that we are intended not to be a bunch of consumers in a crowd being entertained we are intended to be sweepers <laughs> we are intended to be a community of sweepers looking for folks who have fallen through the cracks, the least and the lost, the tired and the broken, the not good enough. And that's kind of inconvenient. We'd rather go and sit back and be entertained. That's not why Jesus created the local church. And again, if you're a part of this community, you already get that. 
You already get that. And that's why we gather to come together and, and sweep. And that's why we love on our kids and teach them about Jesus. That's why this awesome worship team leads us, why the setup team does what they do. They are sweeping. And sometimes, if you're involved in volunteering, sometimes we forget why, we get a little grumpy. But then we remember, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a part of sweeping, right? right. So we go sweeping when we go out and do stuff in our community. Again, you guys are involved in that. Throw, throw some things. I should just, Scott, maybe Scott, or somebody else. Or should we quiz them? What are some of the ways that you guys care about, um, and I know you do have stuff. Name some of the stuff that, that Missio Day is doing to love and serve the community, people outside of our walls. Mercy Hill, yep. Yep, you guys going downtown and serving there. Feed my starving children, yep. Packing the boxes, yep. Packing meals. Somebody else? Church in Slovenia, yep, absolutely. Absolutely, and I know there's more. So, Scott, we're going to have to do a little feature and educate the, uh-huh, yeah? Yeah. Love your Loving your neighbor. That is the simplest way to do it. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 loving and serving people, no strings attached, and you're not trying to even get them to know for sure who did it because you're just unconditionally. Yep, anybody else? Anybody else? All right, there are so many ways that this community is already sweeping, and we're sweeping when we listen to each other and care for each other. We go sweeping when God points us in a direction or prompts our heart in the line at the, well, we don't go to Starbucks, but, you know, at the uh, (laughs) grocery store. I just got fiery darts out of Scott's eyes there. (laughs) Yeah, so we're sweeping. When we get pointed in a direction and we follow that prompting instead of giving in to fear, when we do that, we're sweeping because we have a God who's like a lowly shepherd who doesn't mind doing the dirty work, doesn't mind taking off his royal robes and traipsing around the mud and muck and mire of the pasture to bring us home. That kind of work, it's not beneath our God. And we have a God who's like a crazy woman who just won't stop sweeping. She just won't give up searching and looking for those who have fallen through the cracks. That is our God. And don't you want to follow a Jesus like that? Not just to be in a crowd and admire Jesus, but followers of Jesus offering his love to everyone. So here we go. And I'm closing. Not the typical preacher long close. Here's the big question. We've been to those services. <coughs> I've preached some of those sermons. Okay, um, here's the big question. Where is God asking you, individually, to sweep, right? Where and who? So I'm going to pause for a moment, and then I'm going to pray, and Scott's going to come close us. Where is God asking you to sweep? Where and who? Go ahead and close your eyes and ask Jesus where and who and ask him to bring stuff to your heart. And I'll pray in just a minute. Where and who? God, I am grateful that you are a waiting father. And that you are like a lowly shepherd and like a crazy woman who just won't give up on your lost creation. Help us, God, to be a part of what you are doing in this world. That we would become like lowly shepherds and sweeping women and waiting fathers as well. I ask that you would show us exactly how you are inviting us to do that with you right here in the East Valley. Sweepers with Jesus. And how long will we sweep? Until the broom wears out? No. Nope. <laughs> Until the lamp goes out? No. How long will we sweep? Until, until we have found them? And how long will that be? As long as necessary. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Amen. Father. Thanks, Father. Give it up for that. Thank you. Because you guys are uh, used to uh, two-hour sermons, we're here for another hour. So I'm going to field some questions. No, just kidding. 
Uh, appreciate your heart, Doug. Thanks for sharing uh, Luke 15 with us. Uh, Heidi, thanks for being here. It's great to, this is Doug's wife. Make sure you get to know her. She works for uh, Food for the Hungry and Doug's parents, who I have yet to meet, but we will meet for sure. Can I just close just real quick? You know, as a, as a pastor, you know, it'd be easy to sit there and go, oh, I've been to Luke 15 before. I, I know what it's all about. But part of my sitting under the teaching this morning is, God, show me something new, right? Show me something I haven't really considered before. And, and one general thought I, I, I want to encourage you with as, as your pastor is the question, and I like this from your, your pastor friend in, in Minnesota, why don't you care for the loss? And I'm going to rephrase it the way you rephrase it. Do you reflect the heart of God? Do you reflect the heart of God in that the three illustrations, sheep, coin, son, right? And I've never really thought about this before, and I thank you for bringing this out. Sheep, they're just kind of, they just kind of do what they do, right? And they just don't know, and they may sense danger, and they may maybe sense that they're in the wrong place, but that's a certain type of person out there that's just wandering and just needs to know the right path. Then there's the coin, which I really appreciate. Oblivious. It doesn't know it's lost. It thinks it's fine. It's just kind of settled in the crack wherever it finds itself. And there are people like that in our lives. And then there's the son, right? The rebel outwardly re rebellious person. And there's all different types of people to love. But the, the goal is the same, to connect with them and share the Father's heart with them. And we live in a world where we all have opportunities to do that. And, and I appreciate how Doug closed, and I want to ch challenge you with this. Write three names of people right now on your, on your outline, three names of people that you need to just start praying for, that I believe God will give you opportunities to share the heart of God with. You know, we can talk about big organizations, right? We're part of this, we're part of that. Let's start, and I like how you said, our neighbors. Every single one of you has an opportunity every single day to reach somebody with the love of God. Start with those people. It's easy to kind of mask our service with big, you know, feeding uh, the homeless and serving these. Start with your neighbor, the person you live with, the person you live next to, the person you work with. Because I'm sure they fall into one of those categories. They're either a lost sheep, a lost coin, or a lost son. But your goal is to reflect the heart of God to them. Is that awesome or what? I love it. So thanks, brother. Appreciate you uh, bringing us to the word. Why don't we stand as we do our closing benediction? May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you. May his countenance shine down upon you. May he continue to give you grace and peace and love forever. Amen. Have a great week. Get to know someone you haven't met before, and we're here to pray if you want to talk about anything. Thanks, you guys. God bless. Bye-bye.